Hello! Kenneth Nichols here on the Great Writers Deal podcast, back again. Today, we are here with Serena Chase, the author of the Eyes of Avaria series, a regular contributor to USA Today's Happily Ever After blog, and the author of the fantastic young adult book called Intermission, published by Candid Gate. I really like this book a lot, and I love the very generous conversation that I had with Miss Chase. She had a lot of interesting things to say. She came to writing in a little bit different way. It's something that you should know. So sit back, pour yourself a color teeny, and let the colors fly through the air. Because we'll be right back, right after... This. We're in a library. Shh. 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 Bang, bang, bang. Very, very, very. Library. Franz Kafka Library. The only library you're not sure you've left. All right. We are here with Serena Chase. She is the author of the Eyes of Avaria series, uh, which has been very popular on the internet and elsewhere. She's also a contributor to the USA Today's Happy Ever After blog, where she gets to interact with a lot of parents and help them understand their children a little bit better. Uh, most importantly to me, she is the author of Intermission, uh, a relatively new young adult novel that I liked a great deal. Ms. Chase, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Uh, I'm doing okay. Trying to figure out technology. <laughs> I was born 50 years too late. Uh, but the main thing is, I would like to know about your writing journey. Everybody's a little bit different. How did you become what you are today? Well, I've always been a storyteller of some sort. I did not envision as a young person that my storytelling would move into authoring. I originally took a more musical path. I intended to be a songwriter and a performer. And I uh, received my education in those areas. I have a degree in music business from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. And it wasn't until I had my second child as uh, an adult in my early 30s that I decided I needed to maybe write something a little bit longer. And I started really with... um, pre-reading for my fourth grader. She wanted to read uh, Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine, and it had been a long time since I had read it. I'm an avid reader, and I've always loved young adult fiction, even though I have not been in the demographic of young adult fiction for a long time. Uh, It's one of my very favorite things to read. So uh, I hadn't read it for a while, so I went back and pre-read it just to make sure it was appropriate for her maturity level. And when I finished that book, I thought, I wonder if I could do that, if I could rewrite a fairy tale and and expand it into something else. And so that's what was kind of the germ. I've always loved fairy tales. I've loved young adult fiction. I love fantasy. So I just kind of sat down one day and and decided to try to rewrite one of my favorite fairy tales which is Snow White and Rose Red, not to be confused with Snow White, totally different story. It's a lesser known grim fairy tale. And it was one of my favorite favorites growing up that my mom would read to me before I could read it to myself. So I just sat down and started writing that and it, expecting it to turn into this, you know, little 40 or 50 page thing that I would never do anything with. And it took on a life of its own. My first draft was a 180,000 word manuscript wow. that was horrible. And, and that was um, seven years before the Wren published, which was the final version of, of that manuscript actually turned into two very big epic fantasy novels, uh, The Wren and The Remedy, after a seven year journey toward from first draft to publication, and that released in 2013. 
Uh, right, and so that's a very large manuscript, 180,000 words. Yes. Did you did you read Writer's Digest, or, or were you trying to figure out the, the business in that way, or did you just uh, end up with the you know great big manuscript and then try to figure things out? Well, I ended up with this great big manuscript of a uh, first draft that, you know, as I'm sure you know, a first draft generally is more like a 40th draft, but you're just calling it the first draft because it's the first one that you're happy with. And I decided that it was wonderful and I needed to shop it to publishers and I needed an agent and, and that it was, you know, probably the best book ever written. So I shopped it a little <laughs> bit and, um, realized I, I, I'd started doing some reading on the craft of writing. I read, um, every craft book I could find in my local library, which was limited <laughs> at that time. Um, but I read them all and I, contacted an organization um, called the Jerry B. Jenkins Christian Writers Guild oh, that sure, offered sure. Uh, writing courses. I I don't believe the Christian Writers Guild is operating anymore, but I contacted them and decided to go to their annual conference that they held in Colorado Springs and see if I could, you know, learn a little bit and, and maybe shop my manuscript. And I ended up um, coming home with an agent, which was nice, and, and with three publishers interested. Um, later, they all declined it. And as um, I later learned about things like developmental editing, um, substitu- substantive editing, that sort of thing, I realized, hey, maybe this isn't the best book ever written, <laughs> and maybe I need some help with this, and maybe I kind of suck. <laughs> so, so I ended up, um, I was assigned a mentor with the Christian Writers Guild, who um, is Sandra Bird. She's a multi-published author, um, editor. She's been in the business a long time, and she is wonderful. She was assigned to me as my mentor, and I took the apprentice course that they offered that really starts at, at the basics, and it, it took me through the little things of writing articles and and writing nonfiction, writing short fiction, and that was a two-year course that I took after completing that first draft that I thought was great. Uh, after completing that course, I, you know, I spent this a long time submitting manuscript, revising, 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 rewriting, reading up on the craft, studying the craft, learning the business a little bit and how it just evolves every other day. It, something new has evolved in this business. And, and I ended up turning that initial 181,000 word manuscript into two books. At, and it was it was an advice given to me on one of one of my rejections that I got from a publisher was you might consider turning this into two books um, in a future draft. So I took that advice to heart and I did that. And um, several years and drafts later, it, it uh, the Rin and the Remedy released about a month apart. Uh, what I love about what you're saying is the the kind of difference between. I don't know how much you know about like the 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 fancy pantsy MFA world. There always seems to be, at least in my mind, a dichotomy between uh, people who come to writing either a little bit later in life or not through uh, formal education, uh, and, and and those who do go for the MFA uh, and 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 try to work within that kind of system. Uh, what if, what are your thoughts on, on the kind of two different worlds, which in some ways aren't so different, but also do have a lot of differences? That's kind of a tough question. I think there are different goals that people have as far as what they want their writing to become, what they want their writing career to look like. And I think for some people, uh, particularly those who maybe are heading more toward literary fiction, uh, memoir, nonfiction, those kinds of things. An MFA is, is really would be an awesome way to go. I, I looked into it for a short time, but, um, just to help me with my craft. But at the same time, I thought, well, wow, that's, that's a lot of, of money <laughs> to invest. That's a hard road to go. And I, I am in awe of the people who stick that out and get their MFAs. For me, it wasn't really an option. 
Um, I don't know that I really recognize a huge dichotomy between those who have their MFAs and those who don't. I think in, in publication, we all cup, come up against the same issues of marketability and craft. There's a certain amount of talent involved in craft and there's a certain amount of um, butt in the chair stick to that helps a person to learn craft. But I think what it really comes down to as, as far as education is you need to go with your own learning style. And if you're a person who likes the structure of an MFA program and you find one that really resonate, resonates with you, then absolutely. I don't think it could hurt. I never, I don't think there's any form of education that is not going to be beneficial in some way. I have a bachelor's in music business and I absolutely believe that has benefited me going into a publishing career because as a fiction author, I am in the entertainment business. And so I, th- I think any sort of education you can get, whether it's improving your craft, um, getting some extra letters put behind your name or, um, uh, taking a a small course like the apprentice course with the Christian writers guild that I took anything like that. There's, there's never any wrong way to try and make yourself a better writer. Oh no, I I agree with you. And and that's what uh, I I've really loved about the kind of um, the blossoming of the, the small presses and the independent authors who, who may not have gotten, you know, the same education, which, which is fine. But they did, you know, sit down. They learned to write. They 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 hustle every day to get an audience, and they they interact with everybody. Uh, so so it's it's definitely a, a a different way of doing it, but equally valid, if not more valid. So that's what I'm trying to say. Right. Yeah. Um, I I agree with you there. It's it's just it's equally valid, and 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 there are lots of people with MFAs who are, are going the independent publishing route now too simply because the opportunity is there and it is just regardless of how how talented or educated or or how much you've mastered your craft the market is absolutely flooded with people who want to publish books so the independent route is is very viable for a lot of people who maybe wouldn't have considered it five or six years ago Oh, definitely. Um, I'd like to start talking about uh, Intermission, uh, the book I read. It was recently released in uh, August, I think. November fifteenth. Oh, November. Oh, sorry. Uh, November. No, November, right. November fifteenth. It's from Candon Gate, uh, the publisher, and I really liked it a lot. Uh, would you mind giving us your elevator pitch about it? Sure. Intermission is a story of two talented teens who are navigating adult expectations against the dreams of their hearts while facing problems of a romance that people do not understand. Very cool, very cool. Uh, I responded to the book because I'm also, you know, a good old-fashioned theater nerd, and uh, the first young adult book that I wrote was all about that same milieu. Uh, and, and it's also a lot of fun and, and, and sad and feelings and uh, a lot of books don't have those things. Um, so I guess one of the things that I was curious about was that, uh, the, the, the two protagonists, uh, it's a romance between a 19 year old guy and a 16 year old young woman, uh, which in the, in the history, in the context of history, that's not outrageous, uh, but it's definitely an eyebrow raiser now. I was wondering how you addressed, uh, that that kind of relationship, especially uh, with the kind of uh, not necessarily Christian audience, but but that kind of audience. Well, there's actually a lot of personal experience that fueled how I put that on the page because um, the first romance I experienced was uh, when I was 15 and seeing a 19 year old. So that there's a lot of personal experience there. And it was, um, this book was a long time coming together 
as a story and uh, pulling fact and turning it into fiction was probably more difficult than being able to connect with that age difference as a problem because I experienced that myself. And I knew going in that there would probably be some backlash um, considering that I put that in as a positive thing. Now, as a mom myself uh, now of a 19-year-old and a 16-year-old, when I think of my 16-year-old dating someone who's in college, it gives me hives. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was, I was that 16-year-old, that 15-year-old. And uh, I think in, in the situation in the book, as with my own situation, it really depends on the person and the pe- the couple, the people involved in the relationship as to whether it is a safe and positive thing for the young person in the relationship. I was very blessed in that my romance ended and turned into a friendship and um, there was never a moment where my safety or my morality came into question throughout that involvement. So coming from that aspect, it was very easy to write Noah as a very moral person who he's, he's the type of guy I would want my daughters dating so that I came, you know, coming at that from a mom standpoint, wanting to make to show that age does not necessarily rule somebody out as a prospect for love, but also showing, you know, a difference there between someone he graduated from high school with, Faith's sister Gretchen, and seeing the difference of maturity levels and uh, moralities and personal issues that would make a relationship with someone like her a little less advisable. So I hope, I hope that came across. It was, it was not a difficult thing for me to put on the page because of my own experience as a teen, but um, viewing it through mom eyes, it is a little bit different. And I can see where some adult readers might have a little bit of a problem with it. But so far I've, not heard anything um, through reviews or otherwise where a reader had a problem with the age difference. Yeah, very cool. I I didn't have a, a problem with it, you know, and it's it, I because I I don't know I'm less offended by those things or or they don't trip my my mind as much. But what I loved about the the kind of the romance there was that it reminded me of all the little details of when your that age of where uh okay so we can we can cuddle on the couch but but your leg has to be off the couch and my arm has to be 45 degrees on the side of the couch <laughs> like all those little little things or i don't know i when when the your your girlfriend's mother comes in the room and you sit up even though you weren't doing anything just to show that you weren't doing anything and uh, i don't know i th- those things kind of h- how did you bring those kinds of small long forgotten details to mind well, unfortunately, my, my dating history also included the opposite kind of um, creature <laughs> from <laughs> Noah. So um, I had a little contrast, compare and contrast <laughs> um, going there. Uh, I, probably a little bit of a benefit was when I was really deep in the throes of revising this book, which the first draft I actually wrote while I was... Uh, revising my first two fantasy novels. So in in the later years, as I pulled it back out and decided to revise and rewrite it again um, for the 150th time, I had a daughter in high school and her friends were constantly in my house, eating my food, <laughs> talking amongst themselves in ways that for whatever reason, they felt comfortable around me talking 
through this stuff and hearing the the language that they use um and just their the way they would phrase things and the feeling of immortality and urgency that a team yeah, lives definitely, with yeah. is is so clear when you listen in on their conversations from the outside and I don't mean that in a creepy way because no, they no, knew no. I was in the room and they weren't censoring themselves and just being around teens it, I, I really believe if you're going to write to teens you need to be around teens to be able to pull it off in an authentic way and that was that was a huge thing for me i didn't have to leave my house to be surrounded by teens i was i was also a youth leader during part of that time um in my church and so i had a a different group of girls i was a- around regularly but um just in my house every day after school would be a gaggle of teen girls and so i think that is um a huge way to impress upon yourself and bring everything back up to the surface of those feelings when you're hearing them kind of regurgitated in a new generation it it just brings it back and i think a lot of times as adults we distance ourselves from those emotions because we realize you know that life gets a lot harder than first love as you get older but we need to take into account that in that moment of urgent immortality for lack of a better term it's all there is is that emotion in that moment is all there is and there's no prior frame of reference to temper the the passion and the pain and all the things that go into making teen angst a thing that is real and true when so often we turn it into a joke or as adults a joke or you know just referring to a john hughes film or something whereas in reality it is urgent and it is now and it is all there is for me in this moment is how i feel about this right now and i think we need to connect with teens to be able to remember feeling that ourselves oh definitely i uh, because i'm a, a adult male with no kids or anything it's it's harder for me to get into that that setting but i don't do it don't worry <laughs> uh, no it's so I, I watch a lot of youtube videos um i, I teach 18 year olds a lot of 18 year olds so i i kind of stay in that loop uh, but but that's why I wish more people would would read young adult because we can all relate to that 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 first heartbreak you know to liking that guy or girl and and not having our feelings returned to our parents not understanding us to society not getting what what we feel we all feel that and that's why I love young adult so much. Absolutely, I agree. Young adult, um, I think that's where some of the best writing has been going on for the past 10 years and I I love that people are finally starting to notice that because a lot of these young adult author names were just kind of got lost in the shuffle with you know all these big suspense writers and they're writing for adults uh, take up so much of the limelight in the media and things like that but now all of a sudden uh, these Millennials have grown up reading this exceptional YA literature that they've taken the love for that genre with them into adulthood. And now because they noticed it, people in their 40s and 50s and and I've had readers even in their 60s and 70s are falling in love in love with young adult literature because it's being noticed so you know a lot of you might hear you know on twitter or whatever millennials ruined this but i really believe millennials built ya literature into the beautiful big business money maker not for me but for other authors <laughs> that that it is or in that it's becoming yeah it's it's not uh, i don't know it, 
what I found what I find interesting is that it, it it's always been acceptable in film, I guess, for the past several decades. Like you said, those John Hughes movies are essentially young adult films, yes. young adult stories. But they were, but it's more acceptable to watch one of those instead of, you know, going on a, a bus with a Sarah Dessen novel. Yes, exactly. Just as an just as an off the cuff question that 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 you inspired me to think of, uh, how do we get more more boys and young men to read? Do you have any ideas on that? Uh, if you look at the at the statistics, uh, f- fewer men read than women, uh, and obviously we want everyone to read regardless of gender. But how do we? How, how can we do that? Do you have any ideas? This might seem a little strange as an idea, but I think cover art is a big deal. So much cover art is built to attract the female audience because that's where the money is. And, you know, when it, when it's good for the story, when it's, uh, a romantic sweet cover, and I think, you know, the intermission cover is kind of like that. It's, it's built more toward what the female audience might be looking for in, a YA romance. But I think, um, if we could make cover art a little more accessible to boys that maybe they're not comfortable carrying around a book that looks girly, um, that, that could be something right there. I know. And it's, it's so odd to me that kids are on their phones and their devices constantly constantly <laughs> but they still want to read paper books and it's it's really shocking to me that 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 seems to be a big deal with teen readers that I talk to they're like yeah I love my phone and blah 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 social media this social media that but when I read I want to hold the book in my hands and to me as I love my Kindle I would rather read on my Kindle than anything, but uh, carrying around a paperback book for a boy or a man that might have um, a girl feel to it might just be a little intimidating. And so many books do because um, author world and especially young adult author world is so highly populated with female authors. I think we tend to write female protagonists. So our, our covers, if they feature a human, they're going to have a girl on them, um, in a lot of cases. So I don't know if that, if that could, could help a little bit. I, I don't, you know, being a mom of two girls with no boys, I don't feel like I really have a good, bead on the male psyche at we're, all. we're not that we're not we're not that different <laughs> we're all people yeah I, I I know that in my heart but at the same time <laughs> I think I can't I have um, four nephews my brother has six children and four of them are boys and I can't imagine a one of them being comfortable carrying a copy of intermission <laughs> Well, around I, at school with them. I, 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 I definitely agree with you, but on the other hand, it's, I'm just trying to think back to, you know, 16 year old me. It's a picture of a young gentleman on a, on a hillside cuddling with a young lady. And I, I was all for that when I was a 16 year old guy. <laughs> Like maybe well, the good. I hope more sixteen-year-old guys are into that. That's what. Well, I mean, you know, what I mean, just sitting on a hillside with a young lady. That is, that's what we want, you know. Uh, maybe the like the the title and the the the, the kind of filigree around the title might be. I, I wouldn't have cared, but it might be perceived yeah. as feminine. But right. I I don't know. It's it's a it's a young guy getting to spend time with a young lady, you know. Yeah, cover design is a hard thing. Trying to get the right feeling for. Um, for your book to say all that it is and and uh yeah that's <laughs> I, I have noticed that that a great many young adult novels have are are in blue of a young lady silhouette standing on a hill with the moon in at the top <laughs> of the screen <laughs> yes i have noticed that one yeah, I'm um, mentally now going through my books making sure i don't have any female silhouettes in a moon and i don't yay <laughs> <laughs> i'm not i'm not knocking it because uh 
what do I know and what do I have? But but no, I, your, yours are yours are very cool, and uh, they they resemble uh, movie posters and not the bad ones. I, I don't like the sub movie posters. Thank you. That that's a huge compliment to me because especially with my last two fantasy books, the Seahorse Legacy and the Sunken Realm. That was the feeling that I wanted to get across with those book covers that they would read like a movie. So helpful, yeah. So yay, thank you. That makes me happy. Very cool. Um, and one of the things that I really admired about the the structure of Intermission was that you kind of had the same impulse I did when I wrote my book that I abandoned, but you kept uh, in in structuring the book as in the same way as a musical, which makes total sense because uh, Madeline slash Faith and, and Noah are both mad for musicals right. so their story should reflect uh reflect them uh what are your thoughts on on the way that you structured time in the book because you you begin in in the the future and then go back in time how did what were your thoughts on structuring the book well that was a long time in coming like i said this book um took several years and several revisions and and entire rewrites over that time um the first draft of this book was basically the overture with a series of flashbacks. And um, it was too many flashbacks, which is why it was a first draft. But um, so I think it was after about, let's see, about five years ago, I played Eliza Doolittle in my community theater's Aww. production of My Fair Lady. And... For some reason, I was I was flipping through the playbook, and it just kind of occurred to me that wouldn't that be cool? And so I filed that information away because at that time, intermission was this thing that was I knew it wasn't very good, and I put it away, and maybe I would pull it out again someday, and maybe it would be one of those manuscripts that just stays in the closet forever. Um, so I just kind of filed that information away. So then when I pulled it out again about three years ago, um, when for whatever reason I'd caught an agent's eye and she wanted to see what my upcoming ideas were after, this was before my last Avaria book published, and she wanted to see what my ideas were um, for after that. So I had pulled it out and decided to mess around with it a little more. And um, at that time it was written in third person past tense well that's interesting and yeah so it didn't really give itself to that structure until i made the decision to switch it to first person present tense and when once i made that decision i'd already decided to call the preface or a prologue i was going to call it the overture but i hadn't decided on including the rest of those bits of musical structure until um, I made that final switch to present tense, first person present tense. And then it just hit me that this is happening. All of this is happening right now, even though from the overture to chapter one, act one, chapter one, I, it, it was, it was now and it was urgent and it was happening on a stage in someone's imagination. So it just seemed very natural then to go through and, you know, call it act one, act two, entree act, the intermission, um, changed spots a few times <laughs> over the course of, of the final revisions, but, um, it just seemed to, to fit and when it was all finished and all put together and uh, my wonderful designer made those page um, the, the little design the, accent things yeah right yeah I can't think of what you would call them but um, yeah it just seemed to be like okay yeah this is for real this works and I think that's it, you know it wasn't a conscious decision that was made at one time it was just kind of an as the story evolved into a performance of sorts, it's what the story demanded for structure. Definitely. And, and one of the other elements of the book that is necessary uh, and also worked in a, in a, in a 
unanticipated way was that the, the, the relationship between Noah and Madeline is, is extremely, extremely chaste. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, I, I'm, I'm guessing G rated. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, yeah. Well, I think some of their conversations, um, go mm-hmm. into a little PG 13 <laughs> cat, but as far as, you know, physical intimacy, absolutely. I would, I would say it's, that would, I'd see G, G rated kissing is allowed. Very, uh, yeah, very uh, acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The point is that, that it's, it's not, um, gratuitous or, or yeah. explicit in the least. But so what was your philosophy with regard to depicting, uh, a romance in which, in which there's, you know, there's G rated with kissing while also ha- allowing the, the reader to feel those, those feelings stoked inside them. I was just trying to be real. Um, I believe chaste relationships are possible. I've experienced them. I know a lot of modern contemporary teens who are involved in chaste relationships by that definition. And uh, it's not an option that is offered in a lot of modern entertainment as a viable option um, for how to live your life. And I wanted to show that with Faith in Noah simply because that is what makes their relationship believable on a level that makes her parents' objections irrelevant. Well, and I found in the parents the uh, the father is uh, he's he holds the party line, but I thought that the it was really interesting that the mother became so so angry. Kind of kind of what were your thoughts on the mother? Without I'm not asking you to give away all of the later plot, but what were your thoughts on on depicting how the parents respond to the relationship? I think the mother is a very narcissistic person. And, uh, she does not, since she has nothing in common except a few chromosomes with her daughter, her younger daughter, and so much in common with her older daughter, she sees, um, everything she doesn't want that might reflect badly on her. So it's, it's really not, I think with the mother, it's really not about what faith is or isn't doing. It is more about what faith is or isn't doing and how that's going to reflect on me, the mom. And I think parents a lot of times fall into that trap because we're, um, life is so public anymore and so instantaneously public that Maybe we tend to worry more about um, what do people think of me um, than what's really going on in my kid's heart when our kids act in a certain a certain way when really they're just teenagers being teenagers. Um, she is she was a difficult person to write because um, at, throughout her creation, at some point in early points in early drafts. She almost became this, you know, caricature villain of, that wasn't identifiable as, as a human reality. Where, um, so I had to really work on her a lot to, to tone her down, but yet leave her with the marks of a serious narcissist to be able to make the abuse that she perpetrates against faith come off as believable. And I think to some people, um, maybe who grew up in a really healthy home environment, it's not believable, perhaps. But I have heard from so many people, and I've read in reviews, not, um, where people say, I lived that, that was my mother or that was my father, or that was, you know, my older brother treated me this way. And I think, and it just, it hurts my heart because that's the reality that some teenagers are going through with someone who, who doesn't, doesn't leave marks, um, anywhere, but on their heart and in their head. And those things follow you 
throughout your lifetime. And I, I just wanted to make her very real in a way that, that people who needed to see that you can stand up to that and get out from under it and not let that person's narcissism affect your future. So hopefully, hopefully I did that. Uh, no, I think so. And, and the, it, it, no matter the problem, narcissism, uh, a- any kind of abuse, it's all about trying to remember that it, that you don't have to fall in the same trap and that other people are dealing with their own problems and perhaps in unhealthy manner. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a lesson that, that adults and young people should learn. Um, just, you were mentioning your reviews. What is your attitude with respect to, to reading all of those reviews? You know, most are good, but you always get that one. How, how, what's your thoughts on that? I feel like I have a really good attitude toward bad reviews. Um, generally, I can laugh them off, and I, I just believe not every book is for every person. I've had books that I've read that have 2,000 five-star reviews on Amazon, and I can't get to the third chapter because I'm just bored out of my mind. <laughs> That's true. And so, so you know, and maybe I come across that more often than most simply because I, I do review books professionally, so I, I get a lot of things that cross my desk that, you know, are books that are in that this wasn't ready for publication yet category. But, um, yeah, I, I think with, with my own reviews, of course I love the good reviews and they make me smile and, and, I, you know, I just had one come through from NetGalley today that just, you know, made my whole morning glow and that was wonderful. But, you know, every, every once in a while I'll get one of those bad ones and nitpicky this and nitpicky that or, and, um, and I'll just feel like, you know, that's, that's fine. That's not my audience. And um, Randy Ingermanson uh, said that in a uh, workshop I attended of his one time that, um, you know, bad review. Just remember, that's not your audience. That's not who you wrote the book, the book to. And so that's kind of the attitude I go in with. Bad reviews are going to come. And um, luckily, so are the good ones. And if I write a book and it touches one person out of a thousand, then I've done my job. Oh, definitely. I, I, I just get bummed by the reviews, especially because the stupid number scores are so important now. Right. Where, uh, what, one star. I did not like musicals, so I don't like this book. Well, then don't read the book. It's, it's, they tell you it's about musicals. Right. Oh right. my goodness. Ugh. Uh, I would like to hear, uh, I, I ask some, some of the same questions, uh, of everybody. Uh, I would love it if you would give us some shout outs, uh, for mentors who have helped you along the way and helped you become what you are. Well, the first person I, while well, I feel like I'm speaking to the Academy now, I would like to thank, <laughs> there I you go. wanted to say that. First, I would like to thank the Academy. Now, <laughs> um, I would have to give a big, huge shout out to Sandra Bird. She has been my mentor for a decade now. Um, she is my friend. She is um, my cheerleader and and somebody who kicks me in the rear when I need it. Um, so she is absolutely the number one person. She, I think in when I write acknowledgments, her name is always right near the top <laughs> of the acknowledgments page. I have yet to write a book that she wasn't the first person to read. <laughs> so, um, so Sandra Bird, definitely. Um, author craft, um, things I learned through the Jerry B. Jenkins Christian Writers Guild, that apprentice course was absolutely wonderful. And it's, it was a great experience. Having deadlines every two weeks with writing assignments was a wonderful experience to get used to uh, what a deadline feels like. They, I have a critique group that are three of the most talented authors out there, um, in my opinion. Um, I love these these women's writing style. Um, Charity Tinnen, who wrote the book Haunted, and she's 
written other things. That's the only one that's out right now. Um, fabulous YA dystopian. Uh, she is an incredible editor and proofreader and just a story doctor. Um, Jessica Keller, who writes YA as Jess Evander. She is a fantastic author. She writes fast. I can't imagine writing as quickly as she does. It's, she amazes me with how fast she can put a book together and get it out there. And it's, and it's tight and it's clean and the plot is right on point. And Amanda G. Stevens, who wrote, um, a really, in my opinion, groundbreaking adult dystopian series, um, in the inspirational fiction genre that is so scary real. She is another person who writes just so tightly. Her her first drafts are are like drenched in gold, especially when compared to mine that are drenched in much other things that are not nearly as desirable. <laughs> um and there are so many authors that I am amazed by every day um just reading their work. And I think that's one of the things that has most grown me as an author myself is just reading, reading voraciously. I've always been a voracious reader, but the fact that I, I read professionally now has been a really wonderful way to critically examine stories. So, um, Joyce Lamb at, um, the USA Today's Happy Ever After blog, she's made an incredible difference in my writing career simply by um, saying yes when I say, hey, can I do this interview? Or, hey, what if what if I do a feature story on this? And she says yes. <laughs> and, and she's interested in encouraging. Um, she is also an author herself. Um, she writes romance and some really good paranormal romance too. Uh, so, so many people, the first, um, book series that I read over and over and over again is long out of print, but Lori B. Clifford was the author of the Peppermint Gang series that I started reading in fourth grade, I think. And I still have those books. And the first book in the series, Evergreen Castles, is absolutely worn out. And um, I, in sixth grade, my best friend and I performed a scene <laughs> from it for a, for a school talent show. And so I would have to, of course, mention her because she sparked, I, you know, I've, I've been a, a reader since before I started school, I was reading, but she really got me to, to do that repetitive read, reading a book over and over and over again. Um, JK Rowling, of course, is fabulous. Um, can not mention her if you're a fantasy author. <laughs> and, uh, Jonathan Friesen, who is a contemporary YA author, he's, I've learned quite a bit from not only listening to his story, as I taught with him at the uh, and several other authors at the Minneapolis Young Writers Workshop last summer, and just listening to his story and and how he puts pain and personal experience on the page was so encouraging to me as I was finishing up those last edits and and fixing the ending of intermission to make it ring truer than it did in previous drafts. Um, Jonathan was a huge inspiration that way. He doesn't know it. <laughs> uh, but just hearing his story and, and the vulnerability that it takes to put real, true pain on the page is is inspiring. So I, I could go on and on and on. And oh, on, sure. But that's the, <laughs> those are the ones that first that come to mind. It's a, we're, we're a community in a lot of ways. Absolutely. The Definitely. author community, you know, and there are so many areas of the entertainment industry, I think, where people just assume there's this cat fight culture where people are stabbing each other in the back. And I've never felt that way in the author community, whether I'm, you know, operating within you know, the inspirational author community or the mainstream 
um, general market community. It's, it's so inclusive and, and most authors I've met, they don't care if you're published or not published. They care that you're writing and improving and, you know, we're just, you know, like they say in Galaxy Quest, I'm just jazzed to be on the show. Exactly. And I'm so happy to be a part of, of such an inclusive community that is truly um, speaking, especially among YA authors, we're speaking into the hearts of, of this upcoming generation. And I think it's a very important job we have and a very important community that we are and that we are serving so that we can be um, inclusive of all those different and outstandingly unique young people who are going to come across our books. Definitely. Uh, and speaking of people coming across books, I, I always ask if people have a, a, a bookstore, an indie bookstore that they particularly love. You know, I hate to say this is probably just totally not what I should say, but Amazon is where I get most of my books. It really is. Um, I have a local chain store that carries my books that, that they're very good to me, the staff there, and I love them, um, very much. There is an independent bookstore, um, in, I believe they're in St. Paul that I, I worked with a little bit last summer when I was, I spent some time in Minneapolis and that's Addendum Books and they are just charming. They are charming human beings and they are so supportive of authors and, um, I signed a lampshade and that's in their store. Cool. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. They have authors sign lampshades, which is, is really neat. So, um, I'm, yeah, I was just really thrilled to be able to work with Addendum in Minneapolis St. Paul last summer. They they just charmed my socks off. <laughs> I no, I I like Amazon too. I mean, I like all the places that you can get books, but uh I I think everything's a tool and and we need to we need to have more than one place to get books just to, just as authors in order to, you know, make any money at all. Absolutely. And I think, um, a lot of people don't realize that many authors, including myself, have stores on their websites so that you can buy directly from the author. And especially with independent authors who have to purchase their own books to be able to sell them, it's a good way to be able to get a, if buying directly from the author at a book signing, um, that's not held by a bookstore where, um, they don't have to give the 40% commission or that buying directly from independent authors is a great uh, way to support independent authors because they get a bigger take home and you more than likely are going to get a lower price. Oh, definitely. Um, I like to ask, what are some of the, the guilty pleasures that you have in terms of uh, awful television or <laughs> books that aren't that great? What do you like? What do you like when you're not being literary? Okay. This past week, this is, I have had insomnia off and on the past couple of weeks and I decided I was going to check out, uh, Beauty and the Beast on Netflix. The, uh, the reboot. Yeah, the, when, with, uh, when Emma, it was on in the eighties yeah. or whenever that was, I, I think I oh, watched the TV like show. Two, yeah, the TV show. Sorry. The TV show. When it was on in the eighties, I thought it was just ridiculous. <laughs> And I didn't watch it, but, you know, I was a teenager then. Um, so I thought, well, I'm going to try. I'll watch an episode. And I watched the first episode, and I said, I kind of like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I watched the next, you know, 10 or 11 episodes <laughs> over the course of my insomnia this week. And, and um, I am ready for season two now. So I guess that would be a definite guilty pleasure. I got to, I think I got to about episode nine or ten. I was like, wow, this is getting really soapy. But... I'm just going to keep watching it because it's a lot easier than going and searching for something new on Netflix. <laughs> and and we, we can all have a little bit of fun and it's you have as long as you have a balanced diet with media. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and I sometimes will I some tend to burn out on writing reviews about twice a year and so I'll take a few weeks off here and there and read books 
simply because I just want to read them. And every once in a while, I will go back and reread a, a book by Tamara Lee that is called Stealing Ada. And the, the protagonist is an author. And um, it's it's just a fun chiclet novel that I've probably read a dozen times. But I would have to call it definitely, as far as books go, that book is my guilty pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. I love, uh, I got into Amish inspirational romances for some reason. Really? And there, there's so much fun. I picked one up, and there, there's so much fun. Uh, you know, obviously those are extremely G. But, yes. but I love how the author makes promises to you, and then delivers on the promises. And that they're not pushing forth in, in terms of narrative complexity, or, or they're not surprising me too much. But but they're fun. They're fun. I don't know. Uh, and the most important question, of course, is what are you working on now? Well, because I am a crazy, chaotic brain, I'm working on about three projects simultaneously. Uh, one is kind of a side novel to my eyes of Vivaria series that is um, a minor character from the series is getting his own little story. Um, another one is a contemporary sci-fi romance, if that makes sense, contemporary sci-fi romance. I, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> and um, then I have another that's um, it's just a straight-up uh, contemporary young adult novel that I'm working on depending on the day and what I woke up thinking about that morning and thinking, oh, I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, I'll just ask really quickly. I love the idea of, of adding stories to, to the, an established world as you're doing for your Eyes of a Varia series. Um, I'm thinking of the, the Vampire Academy series where the author has added, uh, added written new stories you know, from the book that she wrote 10 years ago uh, and added them to the 10th anniversary edition. But you also see a lot of indie authors writing just short stories based on the characters and then putting them on Amazon and Kobo and Barnes & Noble. Uh, are you interested in building a world or, 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 you know, an extended universe in that way? Or Well, I have to say I am. Um, it is difficult. It's something my readers want a lot. Um, I keep getting suggestions <laughs> on social media from from readers and fans of the series that, well, what about this person? What about this person? Um, what's their story? I want to know their story. I had a fan fiction contest in my newsletter uh, last fall, and I got wonderful fan fiction entries that just, I don't know, it does my heart good to know there are people out there who actually love these characters enough that they want to to carry them on. So I think um, from a business standpoint, I think it's a good business decision because there is an established audience who already knows this these characters and loves these characters on some level. Um, from a creative standpoint, I knew that... Um, when I got to the end of book four in the Avaria series, I needed a break. I had literally been living in that world for 10 years and I needed a break. And so at, at that point I was just like, I don't know, I might write something in the future about these guys. I might not. <laughs> and, um, really, at, you know, when you, when you get to an exhaustive series like that, because when you look at word count, um, that series could have easily been eight books instead of four. So um, it's exhausting to live in that same place for so long. I don't know how George R. R. Martin does it, <laughs> but um, he seems he seems to be doing all right with that. He has um, a private jet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's doing all right on the staying in that same world. And I, <laughs> you know, obviously Avaria does not have that audience, but. Um, I don't know. I think I miss those characters sometimes. I, I wasn't sure I would, but I find myself self um, missing those characters in that world. And and I've just got to train myself to write shorter books so that I can get them out faster. And um, hopefully I will be able to do that with these uh, little minor characters coming into the light 
stories that I'm planning to, you know, to add to the world compendium, as it were. Well, that sounds very interesting. Uh, and Serena Chase, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you so much for having me. What did I say? Isn't Miss Chase interesting? What I love most about what she was saying was that she surrounds herself with a community of people who are helpful and loving and just want her to be the best that she can be at writing. And she did a really good job with it. Intermission's a very sweet book. The structure is very interesting, and you can see the hard work that she put into it. So pick it up. SerenaChase.com Well, that's all we have for today. Remember, this is Kenneth Nichols from Great Writers Steel reminding you that if Shakespeare did it, so can you. Victor Barranco on trombone. Sergeant Major Craig Frederick on the trumpet and the composition. The Army Blues.